Wij gaan back to the future. Jan en ik gaan op 17 april naar de Microsoft Technologies en .NET conferentie van Nederland. Future Tech 2024 in de jaarbeurs Utrecht. Hey, weet je wat echt super tof is? Nou vertel. Wij mogen gratis kaartjes weggeven. Wat moet je ervoor doen Ronald? Nou dat is heel simpel. Volg ons op TikTok. Daar zijn we tegenwoordig ook oh, te vet, vinden. Hoor. Ja, ja. En op YouTube en maak kans op twee van deze tickets. Ja, vet. Hey, mis je kans niet en dan zien jullie daar. Welkom bij een nieuwe aflevering van de Nederlandse Kubernetes podcast. De podcast over Kubernetes voor iedereen. Ik ben de gast in Ronald Kers en ik zit zoals altijd met... Hallo Ronald. De enige echte Jan Stompers. Welkom Jan. Welkom Ronald. We zitten nu... Uh, uh, is de eerste op Kubecon. De eerste op Kubecon, ja. Ja, alweer een jaar verder. En ja. uh, het gaat hard hè. Is in, uh, in het mooie Frankrijk. Mooie Frankrijk, Parijs, met mooie mensen. Ja, nou, ja, we, we hebben ook uh, twee gasten tegenover ons zitten. <laughs> jo. jo. <Ja. laughs> well, I would like to introduce uh, Jenny Bartsch en Enrico Bartsch. Welcome to our podcast. Hello, thanks for having us here. Great, hey, thanks. Yeah, great to have you. And uh, can you please introduce yourself to our listeners, uh, Jenny? Yeah, so hi, I am Jenny and I am a software developer and graphic designer and a volunteer teacher at schools, bringing computer science, coding and everything about it to the next generation of programmers, coders and creatives. Oh, cool. Nice. There we go. Yeah. Uh, I'm Enrico. I'm a, yeah, let's say, consultant around cloud native technology. I've started my career like in, uh, I think, 2008 with a uh, focus on open source technology. So uh, my way was Linux and all the stuff around it. And from there, I figured out it's it's a good thing to be able to like program your own uh, software. I wouldn't consider myself a developer because, I mean, uh, most of the things that I do is glue code and hacking things together. Uh, <laughs> but it's uh, it, it helps helps me a lot to be able to do this and in the past years I've um, yeah I've been teaching um, cloud native technologies like Kubernetes to uh, to people that wanted to start their journey that's uh, yeah what I currently do hey nice and and what kind of languages do you program well uh, I started back then uh, with PHP um, and uh, <laughs> oh, I think the, I'm the, sorry the things that <laughs> yeah. I like the most about it is the the thing that people mostly hate about it um, I I liked that it doesn't have types that I can have like a variable that at one point is a database connection and the next point is a string <laughs> that, that, that was like yeah uh, so uh, if you if you have a look at my desk it's total chaos and that's what I liked about PHP it can be total chaos <laughs> okay hate that yeah, yeah she, she hates it <laughs> hate, she's a total it. difference yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah. and what kind of programming do, language do you oh, like that? i started with php as well oh, uh, i'm sorry yeah. also <laughs> and i drifted to front-end development um because i'm very creative and mm-hmm. yeah ditched all this php stuff so he does the back-end stuff and i'm front end front-end things yeah php was the main route for me and then down the rabbit hole with all this front-end designing yeah Handler and, and uh, this was a kind of after I started drifting more into the graphic design. So Angular, okay. yeah, um, I didn't like all the technical stuff. Yeah, I think when when all the front end uh, frameworks popped up, yeah, yeah. Um, I think uh, you you left the 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 stage of um, yeah um, front end development when uh, when like this... um, what was it called like. Um, Bootstrap. Bootstrap, yeah, bootstrap, when Bootstrap yeah. was a big thing and yes. jQuery just uh, jumped onto the market. Yeah. And I think afterwards um, they started to have like all these uh, fully fledged front end yeah. development then frameworks, right? They were kids suddenly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> also yeah. important. And I had, and shift important. My, my priorities a little bit. We're here at uh, KubeCon and you had a lightning talk that piqued our interest. Can you tell us something about what you told in your lightning talk? I am working with Minecraft education in schools. And I realized there is a a need for the children to learn independently on topics they are interested in. But first, I got them interested in technical stuff, computer science, coding, and all about this through Minecraft. They didn't know they they like computer science at all until they uh, did some some lessons within the game about coding, uh, about using Redstone, the the equivalent to... um, Like block programming, basically. Like block programming, um, yeah. And it broke talents in them and interests in them, especially in girls. 
and I saw that we we have to had to find a solution bringing all these things in their own language in, in German for us um, to learn all all about this. Downside is there are there is a lot of uh, information for the children in the internet, but not in their main or, or mother tongue. So they can't gather this information because there is a language barrier. Yeah. So we needed a platform where, where the children could learn in their own language about how to set up a Minecraft server, how to create mods, how to implement mods into the server. Oh, that's advanced. Yeah, yeah. It is advanced, but the children are so it's, eager yeah. to learn this. It's it's crazy. It's, it's pretty crazy. Uh, I mean, most of the times we're learning more from the children than uh, the other way around. <laughs> yes. uh, there, there's always that, that one kid um, that tells me, yeah, you can have like a Bedrock and, and Java edition servers yeah. and have a gateway in between them so that both of the editions can play together. And I'm like, what? How? And yeah. Then they're, yeah, there's this, uh, you have to download this and do that. And there's always that, that yeah. one kid yeah. uh, that brings this information to the class. I mean, we're talking about like uh, 8 to 12 year olds. Yes. It's, it's amazing how deep they are um, into into that stuff. And I think most of the, the things, I mean, I, I started my career as a systems integrator. So um, it was always like bringing software and like the operating system together and like make it, make it run, right? Mm -hmm. And and uh, kids basically are doing this uh, with their environments, and they uh, want to start to to dig deeper into the um, yeah into the core of how it works and how they can manipulate things. How I mean, they, how they can trick each other, um, and I mean. Um, at least uh, greetings go out to to Jasper. Uh, he's uh, one of the uh, was one of the first students that I had um, at work. That he had an apprenticeship for um, yeah for IT, and um, I think he started to go into IT with learning Java, and he did that because he wanted to uh, to trick out uh, one of his friends in Minecraft. So he started. <laughs> yeah. That's a good incentive, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that, that's uh, that's what uh, what his motivation. was was to uh, to learn such things and yeah we picked that up and uh yeah. Yeah, minecraft is big because also the biggest vulnerability of last year was discovered in minecraft yeah the log4j yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah. yeah that's something yeah. <laughs> people don't and don't but um you said redstone how um do uh, children learn that um or, or how do they find their way because german uh, children don't talk that good good english i yeah, think yeah that's a big point and it's it's and, annoying <laughs> yeah and how how because the the most of the the, the information um, it, all of the information also in, it, in tech I mean, information is all all english yeah and it's um uh, it's a problem especially in the german education system because english yeah it's a thing we all learn english in in school but just yeah it's it's the tip of an iceberg. It's not enough to to go deeper. Okay. And um, the kids can't learn about all these things they can do in Minecraft because there's a language barrier. So, how do these kids learn about Redstone? Yeah, try and error. They just go into the game and try out. Okay. And that's um, difficult. That's <laughs> very difficult. Yes, even for me. And I, I'm speaking. Because the Redstone uh, in in it's in it's complex. it's not. It's not intu intuitive. No, it's it's, it's counterintuitive. <laughs> yeah, it's it's very. I'm 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 my Minecraft guy, and I'm a technical. Yeah. I'm built just farms for everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like my like my students. <laughs> yeah, yeah I to, I, I'm really excited about the new version with the, the Outer Crafter. Yeah. But it's, it's, yeah, it's something something not for you, Ronald. But I only, <laughs> I only built underground ca castles and uh, caves and that yeah. kind of stuff, you know. So I'm, but I, I'm not touching the redstone uh, not, yet. Yeah, but redstone is... One, it, yeah. It's yeah. because <laughs> yeah, I'm exactly. playing with the family. I've got yeah. my own Minecraft server. My son's plays, my daughter plays, mm -hmm. and I play also because it's it's challenging. Yeah, It is, on, on different levels. Yeah, on different levels. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's... I think our kids started with uh, with basic tutorials on YouTube, um, and they uh, there are a couple content creators um, that do this in German and um, explain very well. But it, for the more complex things, um, there there is uh, not much content. No, yeah, but even the, the German content creators do yeah. English because yes. I follow some yeah. and. and they're doing English uh, podcasts. What, yeah. I, what of I experienced YouTube. was um, that all this content in German um, is not tailored for children. Oh, no. It's too high level 
of, of, of yeah, language. So the kids can't understand. It's more, more too technical, basically. It's too right? technical, yes. Uh, they don't have anything to, to relate with. And we're talking about different kinds of uh, of architectures of infrastructure. We have something that we can relate to. Um, a, a kid that doesn't know like <laughs> how an enterprise looks like or what a programming uh. language is and how all these... Uh, the logic work. behind it. Yeah. Yes. Uh, if you, if you ca don't have anything to relate to, um, you have to do this in a language uh, that... Pictures. Uh, yeah, and with <laughs> pictures and with, uh, yeah, with stories that they can, can relate. Hands to, on, right? Show, showing what yeah. you're, you're doing here. Yeah. But if you want to have your kid in IT, give them Minecraft. Give them Minecraft. <laughs> yeah. uh, I talked uh, prior to the, the lightning talk yesterday. There were sitting guys behind me who said, yeah, you have a, a Minecraft girl. Yeah, nice. I, I started coding with Minecraft. Okay, you, you back up my, my theory that we need more Minecraft in school to bring the next generation of developers and so on. It's a thing. Yeah, we need cool. more of it. And is there a difference between the main version and the education version? Yeah. Uh, first of all, it integrates into the uh, Microsoft Active Directory structure. And it's all uh, oh, like... Nice. Uh, I mean, if you have the, the main game, um, and we're talking about the Bedrock edition here, yeah. so the Minecraft Windows edition, or what you have, uh, find on the uh, on the portable consoles or PlayStation or something like this. Um, and that's not the, uh, the old original Java edition. So we're talking about Bedrock here. Yes. And if you have that... Uh, maybe on your phone or on your console, uh, you will see that you have um, like uh, these things called mine coins that you yeah. can uh, yeah shop in a grocery store or you're giving mm -hmm. like um, like real money into a uh, in-game currency uh, that you can exchange for maps and other kinds of uh, digital items. Yeah, and and you need that in Minecraft education. Yeah. It's more secure for them because they don't need their own accounts. They don't have to put their own real names into the game. Um, they don't have to yeah, register somewhere. I yeah. just give them the licenses, uh, access, and uh, then they can, can oh, play. Nice. Um, yeah, we don't have to pay money. We couldn't pay money yeah. in any way. And there are a ton of um, pre-made lessons from Minecraft education. Oh, nice. Yeah. In English. In English. <laughs> Most of them are in English. They are working on, on solutions and translating some office maps and lessons. Um, something I... I don't get tired about uh, nagging is that the, the um, developers of Minecraft Education always say, yeah, we have an immersive reader, the kids can translate it in, in, in this reader, but I say they need this information in their own language. They, most of them can't read in their mother tongue, so provide it in their mother tongue. To learn all this stuff. Yeah, so. that's why we have a Dutch, po Dutch podcast. Yeah, <laughs> talking English. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's another thing. Yeah. It's more secure. The kids can only play with their uh, student colleagues. No. Uh, yeah, it's like um, if you have the this from group. the perspective of of the Azure Active Directory, all of the accounts reside in a domain, um, and that domain is usually your school or um, yeah the the company that hosts all this. So. Uh, there is no possibility to join um, like uh, private hosted servers on the internet. The only thing that you can do is play together with uh, people on the same domain. Basically. Oh, that's awesome. If somebody uh, wants to uh, do this also, yeah. or can they contact you or is that oh, open? Oh, sure. please do it. Yeah, um, we can just uh, um, just drop our LinkedIn in the show notes and uh, probably people can figure out um, how to contact us yeah. and uh, we can help them with that. But also, like Microsoft is doing lots of things to enable um, um, the, like teachers and schools. Um, there, there are like different programs that, um, yeah... But you focused it. on the US yeah. at this time. Yeah. So that was amazing. Um, how did you? Uh, I mean, you had quite some some experience. <laughs> how different the um, yeah. the learning systems in uh, in the US work um, in comparison to Germany? Yeah, I am at this point uh, the only German Minecraft education ambassador because I don't know language barrier, I guess, because most of the teachers here in, in not here but in Germany can't speak English that well. So they can't access all the information about any program about microeducation. So, yeah, I attend all these um, uh, meetings with the ambassador people, and they're talking about magical stuff in school. There are people who, who are, are there because they do microeducation. Yeah. We have to do That's it. That's a job there. Yeah, it's a job. <laughs> it's a, a job there. job there. Oh, nice. And, uh, yeah, and I, 
I'm always like, oh, I'm so jealous. You, you can have people <laughs> just for Minecraft in school. Yeah. And I am fighting as a volunteer about every euro I have to put in every license here. Yeah, there's, there are a lot of di uh, differences. And I'm trying to bring Minecraft education. Really awesome that you're school. doing that. But we want to talk about the technical solution. <laughs> yeah. Also, because it's not all about Minecraft education, but it was the, the reason why we are, we are looking for a solution, bringing information. It don't have to be about Minecraft, but gen information in general to children. Bij ACC is steeds dat alles in het teken van continuïteit waarborgen voor bedrijfkritische applicaties. Of het nu gaat over Managed OTAP, Cloud en Kubernetes. Ze geven hier invulling aan om door samen met hun klanten een toekomstbestendige strategie uit te stippelen voor het gehele proces van ontwikkelen tot en met productie. We started at some point to give like um, um, holiday camps um, around like Minecraft and all other technical stuff. And um, as I'm a podcaster myself, and for some reason I also have like the video streaming setup that you need with it. Uh, I think maybe maybe let's do a workshop uh, with kids that uh, say uh, what they do, uh, want to do for a job is become a YouTuber. So uh, yeah. maybe let's just set this all up and show them how does it work? How do I have to prepare for something? How hard is it to prepare a five minute video <laughs> yeah. and what do I have to do before, during and after recording yeah, and stuff like that. So we, we started to, to expand this into other um, uh, different uh, technical challenges um, where the kids were interested in and at some point Uh, I think it was for the Chaos Communications Congress uh, in December last year um, where I decided to host a workshop for how to, um, how to host Minecraft servers. It And was full. It was... Yeah. Oh, the room was... Packed. Yeah, we had like tiny tokens that we handed out to the people that uh, made it to the list uh, and there were so many disappointed. So we will <laughs> yeah. do this this year also and maybe uh, yeah, a second time as well. <laughs> uh, but it's, uh, the thing is, um, um, if you are at a uh, conference or even at a conference like here and you have like an open workshop where you want to do technical things, it's uh, people popping up with different devices. So um, I see you have your laptop here. Um, there might be others uh, just a Attending uh, with a tablet or mm -hmm. with a Chromebook or whatever, and you can't really rely on um, like having all the requirements that they need to to get started into the actual technical detail. Um, uh, so we uh, decided to uh, to use something different here, and that's uh, something that I brought with me from my experience that I have as a Kubernetes trainer. Um, we've been working um, very hard on the Hobby Farm project. Um, yeah. Uh, that's something that uh, was originally found by uh, a couple of folks working at SUSE. There is like uh, Eamon and uh, a couple others that I can't remember. But uh, yeah, ha have a look at GitHub and uh, <laughs> see all the contributors there. And um, they, they started the idea of having a software platform where you have like side-by-side -side tutorial and your technical environment on this. And as they are like... Also, yeah, enterprise solutions for this, like like Instruct, you can have this as software as a service, but you have to pay for it, and it's not it's it's not cheap. And for us as volunteers um, who have to to care about like every euro we spend on mm -hmm. this, we uh, wanted to to have something that we can self host and um, yeah have our own um, yeah environment that we can just uh, design and whatever we like like we would like. Um, so. The Hobby Farm project basically is, uh, I mean, as Suze uh, shifted to, to doing things kind of differently, I mean, they acquired um, uh, Rancher and yeah. uh, doing this acquisition, like many things uh, changed. Uh, even Eamon is not uh, working there anymore, uh, started his career, I think, last year at, um, at Red Hat. So, um, <laughs> but, but <laughs> having, <laughs> having yeah. like a software that runs uh, or that rolls our technical environments so that others can have their tutorials and start with it is something that we, um, as a company that I work for, need a lot. So we uh, have, I think, four people uh, kind of full-time working on the open source project and to, to make it... Yeah. How, how does it... 
Um, do you have got like a new uh, your uh, learning environment, yeah. and, and then beside that, there are the tutorial. Yeah, it's just like the instructor. It can be just like instruct, but it can be also more. I mean, it starts with from from the perspective of a learner. I'm having a login page, and I'm registering there, and I uh, have a pre-shared access token. And this access token allows me to um, access whatever material um, the admin provided me for this access code. And that's basically it. You click on it, um, you get your environment uh, spun up, and then um, you can go through the tutorial and we can decide how long the people will be able to see this or how long the virtual machines uh, behind it are actually running. So uh, in the case of a Minecraft server workshop, we told the kids, yeah, you can start this and the server will be up the next seven days after you leave the workshop so that they can play with their friends. But it's not for permanent... Uh, I mean, um, we're not sponsoring like 100 uh, <laughs> Minecraft servers uh, to random kids. Yeah. Uh, it, it's most, well, maybe yeah. after this. And this is running in Kubernetes? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, Hobby Farm itself is, uh, is Kubernetes native, so there is no like database or anything in it. Um, it um, basically runs against the API server. Mm -hmm. Everything is implemented in CRDs and controllers that we use. Um, and yeah, it, it couldn't it couldn't live without Kubernetes. And if you uh, spin up like my, like a Minecraft tutorial, yeah. do you spin then pods with Minecraft in there? Or do you spin up virtual machines really from Kubernetes? And how do you do that? Um, yeah. it, it depends on whatever you would like to do. When we're starting with, um, I mean... No, st like a yeah. Minecraft is really stateful. It so. is, yeah. <laughs> that, that's why it has to stay there for, uh, yeah. for a period of time so that uh, the kids can even play with it and uh, the, the workload itself is stateful. Even the application is stateful. Like yeah. the content that we have in it, the users that we have in it, the scenarios that we create, all this is stateful, but we are not storing this in a separate database. We're just using etcd um, and using CRDs to store our information in this. And that scales pretty well. Okay, but you're storing information in, in, in CRDs? Yeah, is the etcd database not going to be you know, really, really big? <laughs> it is. Yeah. Um, and, and that's something that affects that, you have to that take. Kubernetes yeah. then? At some point, it can. You really have to, I mean, depends on what are you targeting. Um, if we're talking about classroom setups with uh, 20 to 50 or even 100 people, I would say uh, you can even go with K3S and the SQLite embedded thing. But if you have like lots of parallel users, I mean, talking about like, starting from 200 uh, to a couple thousand, then you really need to think about what you're doing with the etcd there. So uh, I would suggest having like at least three master nodes. Mm -hmm. And if you have too much load on there, um, I would even exclude the etcd role to uh, dedicated nodes providing this. And obviously they need like fast storage. Yeah. Well, but that's really awesome because then uh, the, the hobby farm is really built in. It's, it's yeah. part of Kubernetes. Yeah, totally. Um, we also had like a couple of problems with that, <laughs> obviously. <right? laughs> yeah. So we started. I mean, the the hobby farm project was funded at a at a point where uh, I think they were using oh, what was the thing before Instruct? Katakoda? Yeah, I think Katakoda. Um, and Katakoda was acquired by O'Reilly, and after O'Reilly acquired it, there was no enterprise offering anymore. And e even before, the enterprise offering was pretty expensive, and all the uh, the uh, competitors at the time were even more expensive. So they figured out, man, having like a tutorial and a shell <laughs> side by side together, that should be like too hard. So they uh, figured out everything they had about. I think it's uh, the front end is Angular, uh, the back end is uh, Go. Um, they hacked this together. I think on a weekend or something uh, to get the, the basics of it uh, to work and since then uh, we had lots and lots and lots of uh, yeah of changes to the platform uh, so it's not, not Hobby Farm is not the same uh, as it was like uh, two years ago but yeah uh, if you want to scale up to a couple thousand users you need to take care about etcd and uh, yeah also like in the past we were uh, polling the api server every couple seconds to yeah. see if there is a change to a resource uh, obviously we did this before informers were a thing and you could might have asked yourself like two years ago why don't we use a message queue yeah <laughs> I mean, oh, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, live and learn. <laughs> and also, like, like the, the main backend servers, uh, we, uh, yeah, we kindly called it Gargantua. 
uh, <laughs> because it, it's, it was basically a gigantic um, monolith in that whole infrastructure. And uh, during the last uh, 12 months, I think, uh, we chopped Gargantua down to a couple of microservices uh, running independent from each other. Because, I mean, in the past you had like uh, lots of load on Gargantua, but mm -hmm. you uh, can't really figure out what was the real reason why Gargantua was uh, kind of under full load. So you just scaled it up and that at some point blew up. Yeah. So, so back to like the, the Minecraft. Um, are you running then full servers or are they running pods? For the actual trainings environment. So, th so one thing is the platform itself. That runs on Kubernetes, yeah. uh, that runs on CRDs, but it has uh, different environments that you can have. And those environments are basically some infrastructure as a service providers. Um, so, the easiest way... AWS or uh, AWS, Azure? AWS, Google, Azure, Hetzner, DigitalOcean, whatever you would like. I mean, um, as we um, have to be conservative about money, uh, it's uh, for most of the cases Hetzner that we use because they're mm -hmm. damn cheap. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it is, and they're yeah. good, right? So uh, we use that, and um, there is a controller residing in the, uh, in the cluster um, that listens to different kinds of um, yeah, events for creating Uh, virtual environments okay. and that uh, the easiest way to do this is using Terraform and you can just have your own Terraform module with mm -hmm. your cloud provider and set this all up uh, problem with that is Terraform is not perfect and there are uh, situations where it might fail um, <laughs> and stuff like of that course. so uh, when using the Terraform controller uh, please also implement like a cleanup tasks every uh, couple of, of months or uh, weeks uh, that cleans up everything that couldn't be deleted for whatever reason the other way you could do is uh, besides Terraform controllers we have an interface uh, where you have your own controller that you can set up um, I mean the, uh, writing the code for AWS to uh, implement like creating a virtual machine and exchanging an SSH key is not that hard I mean I'm I'm not a, a Go developer myself but I can do it um, so it's uh, and, not too and different. Do you yeah. have also controllers like for VMware or for Proxmox for, KVM? For VMware, we are using Terraform. The same applies for whatever are we, uh, I think Hetzner. Uh, DigitalOcean has its own controller. AWS has its own controller. The, the Rancher Falls created one for Rancher VM. So that's working. I implemented Proxmox with Terraform and KVM, I believe, is not yet included. Uh, I've But been it's working, a, a bit proxmox -y. Yeah, I've, I've been working with uh, with uh, LXD um, in the past. Oh, yeah. uh, there was something. Yeah, a couple a couple guys of me were uh, going to uh, Fostem, I think, this year, mm -hmm. and they discovered there's like a UI and all that stuff around mm -hmm. LXD. So uh, I figured this might be interesting, and also it's like uh, for. Something where you just need like a Python environment or something. You don't le need a fully fledged virtual machine. No, you can use the, yeah. do that in pods. Yeah. So sure. you're you managing also pods. Um, We are learning. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. True. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Cool. So you can cool. have different kinds of, uh, and of of yeah. Is it easy to make your own learning environment? So if I want to, for example, do a Kubernetes uh, CKA yeah. uh, learning environment. That yeah. yeah sure. Is it Is that easy to set up? If you or? are familiar with uh, writing yes. things in oh, Markdown, no. um, then that's all you need for <laughs> the content perspective. Uh, okay. We also have like a uh, something included for charts. Um, I, did, I I can't recall the uh, framework that we're using currently, but uh, we extended the Markdown um, the Markdown syntax by a couple of things and items like collapsible items or uh, uh, we have uh, code blocks that if you click them will directly be executed on the shell um, and if you want to have like nested code blocks in collapsible items and stuff like that that's something that Markdown obviously doesn't care about mm -hmm. but we do so there's a reference you find a documentation on all the different items that you can use in, in Hobby Farm and that's basically how you write down your content. Um, if you're doing this just for your own, you can do this right in the back end and um, have it all there. But if you're working there with a group of people, I would highly suggest to, uh, to use the CLI tools in a, a CI-CD manner so that you can have a, uh, a GitLab or whatever repository and uh, yeah, use your regular flow and then have it um, yeah, rolled out. I mean, 
at the end, the scenarios and all the choruses and stuff like this are also CRDs, so uh, you can convert the markdown to the um, to the matching Kubernetes um, spec and apply that to your cluster. So that's how the um, content perspective uh, works. Okay, and is there is there going to be a, or is there a marketplace already for pre-made content? No. Is there going to be a marketplace for pre content? It's the aim. I wouldn't say that it's the aim currently. I mean, we are, I mean, I'm working at a systems integrator that uh, our service is basically to go to, to companies and teach them how to do that stuff. Mm-hmm. Our main key value is the uh, is the actual content, not the platform itself. Uh, the platform is something that we do open source. We thought about having things like this having a marketplace and uh, i'm pretty uh, if you look at the uh, things that the guys at code cloud did um, it's amazing um, what kind of job they did in the marketplace and the peer review kind of stuff uh, that's something that is uh, not in focus for us currently but as it's uh, on github and open source uh, and we're still uh, searching for for contributors um, if there is someone out there that might want to build a, a shop or marketplace for content creators and content consumers, feel free to do so. Feel free to use it. Uh, feel free to raise a PR and work together with us on this. Oh, that's a great uh, shout out. So, looking at the time, we... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. No, no, I'm having no, too, no, much too much fun. No, because uh, there are a lot of questions that we can uh, still ask, but maybe we can do uh, another podcast in the future because sure. I think there is a lot of uh, stuff to talk about. <laughs> also, the Minecraft education thing is uh, piqued my interest. Our final question is normally, uh, if you have a crystal ball here on the table, we should buy a crystal ball, really, yeah. because we always <laughs> use that anecdote. Yeah. <laughs> How do you see the future of uh, Kubernetes? And uh, maybe in combination with Minecraft education... Uh, and, and hobby farm. Oh, Hobby farm, yeah, sure, of course. You have to answer this. Because yeah. <laughs> no. So that's something that I have to ask myself uh, a lot, also because I mean we're working with different vendors that have strategies and buy each other and stuff like that. So that's a consolidating market uh, that we see here. If I take the things from the past and project them in the future, I would say it's we are not far away from uh, not just managing like pods and containers on Kubernetes. And I I see maybe containers wouldn't be like the uh, the best practice anymore. I mean, there's stuff like WebAssembly out there. Uh, we are already managing uh, virtual machines with it uh, using KubeVirt. So I believe uh, the things that we did with Hobby Farm, like extending the API and using it for things that probably no one in the uh, Kubernetes uh, like core team thought about uh, that you could manage it with them is something that others will adopt because the the main core of it the api server all the contracts uh, the things with uh, policy management and im and stuff like that that's so robust and built to scale that you can just hop on it and bring your own use case to it and i think there will be lots of lots of more software and other things that we could manage with kubernetes so maybe containers go away but I uh, think and hope that Kubernetes sticks for a while. Cool. What do you say? Very nice. Do you have any uh, other insights? <laughs> no, actually, I don't. I hope that we, yeah, from the educational perspective, I hope that we find ways to bring all this new and, and fantastic stuff to the next generation. This is, this is my wish for the for the future. Yeah. Enable the next generation to use all this yeah, crazy let's make it stuff. less complicated. Yeah, right? make it less complicated so I could use it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and me too. Yeah. So. <laughs> so, yeah, thank well, you. Jenny and Enrico, thank you so much for taking your time to have a chat with us about all of the great things you're doing and we're going to follow you uh, with great interest. Thank you. Hope yeah. to have you back Thank in you future. very much. Thanks thank for you having much. us. Okay, yeah. see ya. See ya. Deze podcast is een initiatief van ACC ICT en wij zijn te beluisteren op onze website k8spodcast.nl via Spotify, Apple, Google Podcast en alle andere favoriete podcastproviders.